I would like to welcome everyone to another super fun session of Outside In. And Outside In, as you know, is a series of talks that uh, Professor Sadamni began at, uh, in uh, June this year. And we've had a steady audience and we love that everyone keeps coming back to learn more about different aspects of ecology. And in November, we are focusing on different microbes. So in this talk, uh, we have uh, Dr. Samay Pandey and he will be introduced by Sneha. So uh, I'm going to hand it over to Sneha. Sneha, please uh, introduce Dr. Samay. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, whosoever has managed to join us today for this Inside Out session. Today, we will be hearing from Dr. Samay Pandey, uh, who is Assistant Professor at uh, IIC Bangalore. So today, he'll be talking about prey-predator relationship in bacteria. And he has been working with uh, different uh, bacterial interactions since his PhD. Uh, he, in his PhD and postdoc, he has worked with the cooperative behavior of bacteria. But now his current research topic is uh, slightly different than his earlier research topic, which is prey-predator relationship in bacteria. And today he'll be talking us uh, about that uh, interesting topic. And I'm really excited to uh, 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 ask him to tell us about this uh, topic. Uh, Samay, would you like to start? Sure, yes. I share my screen. Am I sharing my presentation now? Yes. Okay. Uh, hi. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for for joining on a on a Sunday morning. Uh, a special thanks to to Pavitra for organizing the the entire exercise. Uh, Sneha for for the introduction. Uh, Deepa invited me, so thanks a lot. This is actually one of my it's the first uh, general lecture that I'm talking about on the topic that I'm very fascinated about. Uh, and Saudamini for, for initiating the entire exercise. Uh, uh, so I've been going back and watching the, the videos that, that the previous speaker talked about. Uh, so, and it's, it's been really fun. Uh, so as I said, today I'll talk about uh, the topic that I'm very fascinated about, uh, and that is about microbial predation. Uh, most of you are aware of the topic that we're discussing today. Uh, but we'll narrow down our uh, uh, our discussion to bacterial predators more precisely. So microbial predators might include also the eukaryotes, but we'll primarily stick to prokaryotes. Now, before I jump on to the topic of bacterial predation itself, I'll start off with, I'll kind of motivate my entire talk with the help of these series of Hollywood blockbuster movies. Uh, so just, can you see my cursor or my, my mouse here? Yes. Great. Uh, so the series of Hollywood blockbuster movies, as, as many of us know, were originally uh, uh, motivated by a science fiction novel by Michael Krishnan. So if you read the novel, it's probably more exciting. So what you get to see is our experience is that uh, we have a very efficient predator, uh, right, the dinosaurs, and the original novel actually focuses a lot on the T-Rex itself. Uh, and this predator has evolved or has adapt has has many adaptations which allow it to be such an efficient predator. So it has long claws, uh, sharp teeth. It can run fast to catch its prey uh, to catch its prey and so on. At the same time, you also can get to read about how different prey uh, can escape predation. Uh, they evolve mechanisms to hide. They run faster. They fly and so on. So I'm very un keen on understanding how these mechanisms of uh, to be better to, to, to evolve better predation strategy and to avoid predations uh, come up. Uh, so before we jump on to the bacterial predators itself, I want to classify predators in general and only for this purpose of this talk. And this is a very broad definition and very relaxed definition. So an organism killing another organism as a to, to eat or to feed on it to gain uh, energy and, and resources for growth and reproduction is predation for the purpose of this presentation. So you can also classify, let's say, if an herbivore completely uh, eats up a, a plant uh, so that the plant is dead and can no longer survive, then we'll classify that as, that as predation for the purpose of this talk. 
Similarly, if an individual from a species kills another individual from the same species and eats it, uh, we will also call that as predation. Okay, so predation is simply an organism killing another organism and feeding on it. So when I say the word predator or predation, some of the quick uh, responses that uh, or answers that I get generally if I have like a audience in front of me, the examples that I get to hear are you know, tigers, lions, wolves, uh, eagle, shark, and we also have uh, predatory plants, uh, car carnivorous plants. However, what I'm going to tell you is that predation, uh, the, the way we are visualizing these predatory organisms is fairly modern. And predation itself is a very ancient behavior. Uh, so this is a timeline of, let's say, origin of life on our planet. Uh, so Earth came in on existence about 2.5 billion years ago. Then the most concrete evidence for existence of life that we have is about 3.5 billion years ago. And that are these stromatolites. Uh, so these are these column shaped structures uh, and they are, they are very famous uh, in, in around Western Australia. And these structures are formed because of the layers of microbial biofilm. Uh, and some of these stromatolites are dated to be about 3.5 billion years ago. So that's our most strongest evidence for the uh, existence of life. Uh, if you go further along and come closer to the current time, then about 2.7 billion years ago, eukaryotes came into existence. So organisms with, with nucleus. And for the evolution of eukaryotes, it is proposed that two unicellular organisms, one of them engulfed the, the other one. And the idea is that maybe this, this ability to engulf uh, one organism by another organism might also be, uh, you know, that mechanism might have evolved or emerged as a predatory mechanism. Uh, the other ideas that support that predators might have existed during the evolution of eukaryotes or even before that is because there are fossils which suggest that microorganisms started accumulating uh, deposits of salts around them. So they kind of developed shell around themselves. An idea is that maybe this was to avoid predation or being digested by the predator itself. Now, when we come much closer to the current time, about 65 million years ago, uh, dinosaurs existed, which are fairly ancient for our times because humans came into existence about 200,000 years ago. So I couldn't even place human on this time scale properly. So what I'm trying to say is predation existed way before human ever came into existence. And predation as an interaction or as a mechanism to drive evolution will exist far after humans uh, go extinct. Okay, so now when we go back to predation itself or the examples of predators that are highlighted before, such as tigers. So for example, tigers has its paws and claws which allow it to hold onto its prey. Uh, eagle, which allows, uh, it has very strong eyesight, which allows it to spot its prey. Uh, similarly, uh, we have wolf, which has again, a very keen sense of smell, sharp, very sharp teeth, which can rip open its prey. Uh, and these are carnivorous plants, which digests its prey using digestive enzyme and make, basically make a prey into a soup. So all these different adaptations that these predators have can in principle be classified into three distinct categories. So adaptations to find your prey, for example, eagle having a strong eyesight help it find, uh, will allow it to find the prey much more easily compared to you know, when it's flying and, uh, and it's at, it, at a far distance. Uh, to kill its prey, so we know tiger has strong jaws, strong paws and claws, which allow, uh, make it a better, more efficient predator and also to feed on its prey. For example, the, the carnivorous plants. So these plants are very uh, interesting example because they form these bucket-like structures, which are filled with, uh, with enzymes, digestive enzymes. And they hunt for uh, prey, uh, prey insects. And these are usually crawling insects. So once an insect falls into this trap, uh, the insect is digested and is made basically converted into a soup. And the soup can be absorbed by the plant. So these three types of adaptations that predators usually show. Uh, in response to this, prey also evolves. Uh, so you have, for example, antelopes and all different species of antelopes. Uh, many of them can run very fast to escape predation. You have uh, a tortoise, which has this hard shell, uh, which probably allows it to survive better. You have camouflage among stick insects, which makes it difficult to be spotted by its predator. You have uh, 
uh, strategies which allow societies to avoid predators and so on. So what I'm trying to say here is, over time, predator evolves strategies to better hunt, and at the same time, prey also evolves strategy to avoid predation. And therefore, uh, predation is one of the major sources which leads to evolution of form and function and diversity, and also the life as we see it today. Uh, so this is about predation. So that's why, in general, we are very interested and keen on studying predation and its effect on ecology and evolution of animals and life uh, on our planet. Now let's move on to the microbial aspect of it. So why should we study microbial predation in, in particular? And that's because a planet is primarily a home of my, uh, is primarily consisting of microbes. Uh, so you can consider that this planet belongs to bacteria or microbes and all the eukaryotes, which are called in a loose sense, higher eukaryotes, are probably just transient passers because as I said, microbes have existed way before eukaryotes or multicellular eukaryotes ever came into existence and probably just like predation, they will exist way after eukaryotes have gone extinct. So these are some numbers which might actually make this point even more clear. So when we look into the, uh, look at the ocean and let's say make an estimate of the total number of microbes that might live in that are probably existing in ocean, then it is estimated that there are about 10 to 28 bacterial cells in oceans. Uh, clearly a huge number, so in principle you have 28 zeros after one. But just to put it in perspective, what this means is that there are probably more bacteria in our oceans than the total number of you, uh, total number of stars in the known universe. So we have more bacteria than the total number of stars. Uh, when we move on to the terrestrial side of the story, then just a kilogram of soil will probably contain more bacteria than the total number of humans, tigers, lions, and every other predator that I talked about have ever lived put together. So we have more bacteria in one kilogram of soil than all the different fascinating examples of life that we talked about. Okay, so it's not very difficult that they rule our planet and they're responsible for making our, our ecosystems tick. Now, I'll not go into the details of all the different functions that microbes perform, but just as an example, because it might help in the further discussions for many of you to understand how, they, how the different types of experiments are done, uh, think of the primary producers, the plants, right? Uh, but plants themselves, we know that they fix carbon so that they get uh, and they, they make their own food and the, the food chain basically starts from, from the plants, giving it to the primary consumers and so on. However, plants are also not completely independent. They also depend on their microbial symbionts, primarily for fixing nitrogen, for example. Uh, so plants also depend on, on microbes and primary consumers such as insects also depend on on the microbes, for example, these are uh, these are sap feeding insects, and it's well known that these the sap of the plant is carbon rich. So these insects need nitrogenous uh, a fixed nitrogen in their diet, and this is supplied by microbial symbionts. So just like insects, many high eukaryotes, including humans, are dependent on on their symbionts, which live inside these organisms and also on these organisms. Now, before I go further and talk about microbial predators themselves, I'll quickly highlight two of the simplest ways to study bacteria, right? So we all know bacteria are difficult to visualize because they're very small, we can't see them through naked eye. So to see bacteria and maybe to, to start our analysis and do some of the simplest experiments, what you can do is you can take, let's say, soil from this near this root and put in a very crude sense, I'm saying this, put the soil under your microscope and try and observe these bacteria because microscope can magnify the, the field of view. The other approach can be you can sprinkle this soil on a petri plate. So petri plates are containers on which we grow bacteria and they're filled with nutrient media. And on this petri plate, each cell can then grow and divide and make copies of itself and become millions of cells. And of course, when all of these cells are present together, you can visibly see that colony. So you can see a bacterial colony where there are millions of cells present within individual colony. Okay. So these are two ways we can study microbes and I'll talk about some of the results that we have only based on these simple techniques. So I'll not go into the details of the technicalities of everything else that we know about, about microbial predators. Okay. 
So first, before going into the details, let's have a look at different microbial predators. Just the examples, a cursory look of how fascinating this world is. So this first example, I'll not mention, I'll not, I'll not, I didn't write down the names here, but happy to tell you if you ask for. So the first example is Myxococcus xanthus. Uh, this is a bacterial predator. This is a soil bacteria. And we'll be discussing a lot about this microbe. So yellow uh, rod shaped structures are individual cells of these bacteria. Uh, and the green parts are prey bacteria that are killed and lysed and you know are lying in pieces here. But we'll talk about this in more detail. So I'll not, I'll not uh, uh, tell you much about this right now. The second example I'll highlight is uh, Delovibrio. This is Delovibrio bacterium moris, to be precise. And this bacterial species is very interesting in a way that it's an aquatic predator. So it hunts other bacteria, but for doing so, it basically shoots itself on its prey and acts like a torpedo. So it pierces the cell that it wants to kill and hunt. And once it's inside that prey bacteria, it eats it from inside out. Uh, the third example, and these are, as I said, just a cursory look at different types of bacterial predator is Microvorus. This is again a similar bacteria like uh, Delovibrio. Infect their host uh, or their prey uh, and then grow and divide inside the prey and then burst open. Uh, next, this is not a bacterial example. Uh, it is a eukaryotic example. It's an amoeba. It's called Dictyostelium discoidium. So this green shaped structure here is, uh, is an amoeba. And the red structure here is a yeast. So what you're seeing is an amoeba phagocytosizing a yeast cell. It's basically engulfing it and then digesting that yeast cell. Uh, it's a very interesting example, very uh, commonly, uh, a lot of people study this example and I think it's a fascinating model system. So I could not resist putting a eukaryote here. Uh, another example, uh, I love the name of this particular bug, this small one here, which is clinging onto its prey, which is much bigger. And this, big, this, this particular species of bacteria is called Vampyrococcus. As the name suggests, it acts as a vampire. So what they do is they latch onto their prey and then suck the nutrients from their prey cells and that's how they kill them. And we'll talk a little bit about this bug also. And the final example is Dacto, uh, Dactobacter, very similar to, to how the Vampyrococcus feeds on its bacteria. Uh, so in principle, you have two mechanisms where either you get the predators engulf their prey or they digest them outside or digest or cling onto them or enter, them, enter the prey and digest them from inside and grow. Now, this is about the diversity of different or the different examples of predators. And I just wanted to put it out there because usually when we talk about microbial predators, just a couple of examples pop up, but I want to say that there are many different fascinating examples that are just some of those that I wanted to highlight. Okay, so these are examples of predation. How do bacteria actually kill other bacteria? Uh, and there are different mechanisms that they can employ. Uh, and we'll talk about these mechanisms in more detail because I think that's it's it's very important to understand the biology of these microbes. Uh, so I'll highlight these four mechanisms. First one being toxins. Uh, so toxins are proteinaceous molecule, uh, and there are multiple types of toxins that have different effects on a cell on a living system. So a cell, like most of the uh, even eukaryotic cell, uh, like just like bacterial cells, have a DNA, which is all the information that cell a uh, cell needs to survive and function. This DNA only has the information, but this information is passed on to the functioning uh, organs uh, by mRNA. So this is our messenger molecule, and the function is actually executed by proteins. So the proteins, uh, the the toxins can inhibit either DNA replication or even initiate its degradation. So that's one mechanism of killing. There are a set of toxins which inhibit synthesis of messenger molecules. So even if you have your information, you're not able to give the message to the system that needs to execute this information. And sometimes some toxins inhibit synthesis of protein. So even if you have the information, you can give it to the system that actually functions, uh, uh, that, that transmits this information, but the, the proteins are not synthesized. So that means again, uh, the cell is dead because uh, uh, it's just lying there as a, as a vegetative unit without growth and reproduction. And finally, there are toxins which inhibit membrane synthesis. So all cells are enveloped with some sort of a membrane 
a uh, bilayer or cell wall and so on so there are toxins which inhibit synthesis of these membranes uh there's one particular example that i'll highlight so this is bacillus subtilis a rod shaped bacterium it's a gram positive bacteria uh, so each rod shaped structure here is a bacillus subtilis micro and if it grows and divides it can make multiple copies of itself when starved these bacteria enter a stage called spore so they initiate this process of sporulation and spore you can imagine as kind of a seed of bacteria so uh, the seed does not itself grow and divide right it needs to germinate uh, so these spores just wait for favorable conditions to uh, to reappear and then they transition back into vegetative cells where they can again grow and divide however before this transition is completed there's a stage where these microbes secrete toxins that can degrade membranes of neighboring microbes and if there are neighboring microbes present in an environment they will degrade these microbes because the membranes are now exposed basically you rip open the cells and use the nutrient from dead cells they in order to avoid becoming a spore these microbes can kill other bacteria by synthesizing these toxins and secreting it out in the environment so that's one example of mechanism of predation the second mechanism of predation is digestive enzyme uh and for that we'll go to our one of our favorite example which is vampirococcus so as i said vampirococcus can attach to its prey cell so what what happens in this particular interaction is vampirococcus secretes or basically injects a lot of digestive enzymes into its prey and basically makes that prey into a sack of lot of interesting tasty nutritious soup and then sucks it up, uh, sucks it out so that's a second example of how di digestive enzymes can be used to hunt other prey bacteria the third example of a uh, mechanism of predation is secretion systems so this is contact dependent killing so cells have to come in direct contact with each other and then only they can kill their uh, their interacting partner sometimes it can be in this particular example it's not a prey but it's just a competing species uh so secretion systems you can imagine as kind of spears so they just you know uh rip a hole into into their competitors and this was a very nice study by my allen and and will ratlos group uh what they did here was they put two different strains of a bacteria so uh, a red one and a green one together both have them have different types of spears and protection mechanisms from these spears so these spears when they when they mix these bacteria together and let them grow and remember this is now a colony of bacteria so these are millions and millions of cells so you can in principle see them from naked eyes but now they are colored also so you need some sort of a filter to see that color so what happens when you put these bacteria together is that they aggregate themselves into distinct regions uh and similar this is again the same interaction is just that they are growing in different conditions but when they don't have these spheres you can see they can nicely mix into each other so these spear kind of mechanism they can be used the, the the secretion system or contact dependent mechanisms can be used to kill other microbes by predators uh, and in this case i highlighted this particular example because even though it's not being used for predation but just want to highlight that similar mechanisms that bacteria use for predation they can use for other purposes also uh, and this particular mechanism of contact dependent killing is used by the favorite bug of my lab that is mixococcus zandus and as i said we'll come back to that bug at some point okay and finally antibiotics uh, so antibiotics are probably the most celebrated example of mechanism of predation by a uh, predatory bacteria uh, so in this particular case a student from my lab did exactly the same experiment that i talked about before he just took up some soil sample and put that soil sample or suspension from that soil sample on a agar medium on a growth medium that only streptomyces will like uh, and this is the streptomyces colony that you get so it's a very common bug in in the soil and it is also famous for being kind of a factory for for antibiotics uh, that we are using to combat lot of infections antibiotics are produced by these bacteria either to inhibit the growth of their competitors or in sometimes also to kill them and once your competitors are dead you can also use the nutrients from these uh, these dead cells as your food source so production of antibiotic can also be used as a mechanism of predation or mechanism of killing by the predatory bacteria okay now before i go further i want to highlight what this also means is that antibiotics is a big contribution by predatory bacteria 
to and this is probably affected it's one of those discoveries like identification of antibiotics by uh, by by fleming is probably one of those discoveries that has changed the course of human evolution on our planet uh, because antibiotics have allowed us to control microbial infestations and primarily we use them for for controlling pathogens uh however before i go further and talk about significance of antibiotics and contribution of uh, microbial predators towards production of antibiotics and identification of new antibiotics uh, i'll summarize whatever i've talked about today because we'll make a small transition from here on so what i talked about till now is we first defined predation as a very general uh, interaction where an organism kills one one organism and feeds on that uh we talked about how both predators and prey evolve new mechanisms to either hunt more efficiently or prevent themselves from hunting and this has led to kind of evolution of more form and diversity we then talked about examples of microbial predators uh and we just mentioned six of them and then we talked about mechanisms of predations which included toxins which inhibit either dna replication uh, synthesis of rna or protein synthesis we talked about secretion systems digestive enzymes uh, i didn't talk about secondary metabolites uh, because primary this is fairly a rare mechanism that microbial predators use uh, and antibiotics uh so from here on we'll try to understand how microbial predators might influence synthesis of antibiotic and might actually create trouble for for humans in general while using antibiotics uh, uh disproportionately so let's go back to this slide so as i said discovery of antibiotics a major discovery probably has contributed a lot to the evolution of human race and probably has changed the course of evolution of humans and so on uh, these are big statements but i i genuinely believe that true however all the work that is being done to control microbial infestations and infectious diseases that are brought about by microorganisms or primarily by bacteria might very easily be undone by emergence of antibiotic resistant so we have antibiotics to treat our diseases or to get rid of non friendly microbes and these non friendly microbes can gain resistance to antibiotics and then our antibiotics will be useless uh, against these bacteria so this is a very scary graph that uh, tom bokel's group published uh, last year and this graph is basically generated from data that they gathered from animal farms uh so what a deeper red color in this graph means that there are higher frequency of antibiotics against which resistant microbe was present in that particular region so if you can see this this global map lot of antibiotics up to 70% of the antibiotics that we commonly use are ineffective at majority of these regions around around eastern india uh or uh, basically most of the resistance is concentrated in asia and and the subcontinent uh and therefore now we need to understand two things first of all how resistance pops up uh and the explanation based on this graph one can give is that because the data is collected from animal farms which generally use lot of antibiotics the resistance pops up because of excessive use of antibiotics which is very fair so anthropogenic activities human involvement can lead to increased resistance of uh, increased spread of antibiotic resistance fair enough but we still need to understand this process better second we need to find out mechanisms or strategies to control antibiotic spread of antibiotic resistance or we need strategies that will allow us to even kill antibiotic resistant microbes so we need two things better understand resistance and then kill the resistant microbes and we want to understand these two processes using the favorite bacterium of the lab mixococcus xanthus so this is a bug that we commonly use in the lab uh, among many others uh, and this is a very fascinating life cycle of mixococcus xanthus it's a gram negative bacterium it's a soil bacterium so let's start from the center here so these rod shaped structures are vegetative cells uh, so they can grow and divide simply by taking up nutrients from their environment uh, and make copies of themselves but when starved these bacteria aggregate together and initiate a process called development which ends up with formation of a fruiting body so fruiting body you can imagine is some sort of a ball or a sac which is tightly packed with spores of mixobacteria and remember each spore is like a bacterial seed it does not grow and divide but can tolerate harsh environmental conditions 
and these seeds these spores themselves can then germinate into a vegetative cell which can continue this cycle uh oops yeah which can continue this cycle again but at the same time these vegetative cells can detect other microorganisms in their environment let's call them prey and they can hunt them kill them and use nutrients from the dead cells as their own food so that's why we we use this uh, organism as a predatory bacteria so for the purpose of this talk think of this life cycle as vegetative stage where cells grow and divide and a starvation phase where they just don't grow and divide they just live as multiple seeds stacked together which will allow them to persist in the same environment for long long time and because these vegetative cells can predate you can imagine that this stage predation also works out but before i go on to the predatory aspect i'll just highlight these two very interesting images i thought you might be interested in it uh, so this first picture is colony of myxobacteria so these are millions and millions of cells of these bacteria and you can see them visually and they form these very beautiful patterns you can see these bacteria and the second image here is fruiting body of myxobacteria so each of these yellow color structure is a sack of spores and they contain anything between 10 to 50000 spores present in uh, in these in, in these bacteria uh, in these in these sacks as i said uh, myxococcus xanthus is a predatory bacteria Uh, so they hunt other microbes, and this is an image which very nicely shows predation by Myxococcus xanthus. Again, a colony level image. We are seeing millions and millions of bacteria, so you can see them through naked eye. So what we what we see here is is this big circular structure is colony of E. coli. So there are millions of cells of prey bacteria, uh, and the struct and the circular structure here, which we can see as dark holes. This was the original colony of Myxococcus xanthus. so what has happened over here is that this colony of myxococcus xanthus has completely invaded e coli colony has digested these millions of e coli cells and has used those dead cells as food source to expand further into the prey region now when we talk about the mechanisms of predation i told you these four major mechanisms of predation right so myxococcus xanthus can make use of all four of these mechanisms so it has every mechanism in the book that is available to hunt or kill or harm other microbe it it the uh, myxobacteria can produce toxins they synthesize digestive enzymes they use secretion system so they also engage in contact dependent killing and they use antibiotics uh and even the lab strain of this bacteria can potentially synthesize more than 90 antibiotics it's just that they are not characterized that well now using this this micro we want to understand how this bacteria can affect the diversity of 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 non myxobacterial isolates in nature and the reason we are interested in that in in this question is because as i said this bacteria forms spores and these fruiting bodies that means it can persist in the same environment for a long long time that means it can influence the local diversity for a longer time right uh Screen is frozen. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. I forgot to tell you. Uh, this is an interesting, and I think this is kind of an anecdote and uh, considered like a general wisdom. So don't take it as a scientific fact. But myxobacteria are considered uh, to use a strategy of predation called wolf pack predation strategy. So we know that wolves help each other to hunt other bacteria. Similarly, it's assumed that uh, since we don't have a concrete data on it, that myxobacterial cells. coordinate uh, of their attack and many cells attack a single prey so it's basically many cells helping each other to hunt uh, during predation okay so as i said the question was because m xanthus has fruiting bodies the spores can persist for long long time and can produce antibiotics can they influence antibiotic resistance in nature uh and to answer that question we first did a simple experiment so we just picked up soil sample as i said m xanthus is a soil bacterium uh and so we collected soil samples and tested with the m xanthus our favorite bug is present there or not and then for each soil sample we measured the total number of bacteria and we also measured the total number of microbes that are resistant to antibiotics so you can just plate it again sprinkle your soil on this agar plate and each cell will grow into a colony simply by counting that colony this big dot you can measure the number of bacteria that were present in a soil sample and you can do the same thing but this time add antibiotics in the media it tell you the number of bacteria that can tolerate antibiotics in the in the sample 
now using this experiment we see the following results so any soil sample so in general when the m xanthus is present so m positive soil sample we see certain frequency of antibiotic resistant isolates so y axis here is the frequency of bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics whereas for the soil sample when there are no antibiotics uh, no mixococcus xanthus was detected in the soil sample we see that the frequency of antibiotic resistant microbes was significantly less right so what this data tells us is that presence of m xanthus is correlated with presence of high frequency of antibiotic resistant microbes now remember the word correlated it does not mean that m xanthus is responsible for this high frequency of resistance or emergence or evolution or maintenance of this resistance it simply means is mixococcus xanthus is present then there are a lot of antibiotic resistant microbes also present in that soil sample in that environment it does not need any causation it, you don't have to invoke any causation here right as in it, it's simply like you can't you can't it you can't extend your correlation data to any causation it's just m xanthus is present there's a lot of antibiotic resistance okay now to test whether m xanthus the bacteria in question our predator is that actually responsible for increase in resistance frequency or maintenance or evolution of this resistance we did another experiment so this experiment looked something like this we took soil community added it into lot of nutrient media so lot of food that the soil community can get and added mixococcus xanthus our predator in that soil community and as a control experiment we only inoculated soil community into in a nutrient media now and let them grow together and again measure the frequency of antibiotic resistant isolates for variety of antibiotics that we got our hands on so if indeed mixococcus xanthus is responsible for increased frequency of resistance or evolution of resistance or higher maintenance of resistance then you should see this pattern that is when m xanthus is co cultured data should be a little bit the frequency of resistant isolates should be higher compared to m xanthus was not enough compared to the case where m xanthus was not inoculated and this is how our results look like so indeed what we see is that as soon as you add m xanthus to a soil community they tend to maintain higher frequency of antibiotic resistant bacteria compared to soil community which you just keep growing in the lab without addition of mixococcus xanthus in that environment so now this data clearly demonstrate that m xanthus is present can enrich or lead to maintenance of higher frequency of antibiotic resistance in natural soil sample that are brought to the lab now with this i'll go back to this scary graph that we started off with as i said this graph or this this data was generated primarily from animal farms uh and it makes perfect sense that there is high frequency of antibiotic resistance when you have uh near the farms because you use lot of antibiotics there but on what what i'm trying to say here is we need to pay attention to microbes such as mixococcus xanthus streptomyces or any other bacteria that are making antibiotics and these bacteria can therefore influence the antibiotic resistance frequency in nature also that's what i'm trying to hint at here our data doesn't clearly say this we are not saying that antibiotic resistance is emerging because of predatory bacteria and so on and so forth but this data suggests that we need to keep an eye on the contribution of antibiotic uh, antibiotic producers on the evolution of resistance mechanisms and strategies and their spread okay so now if the antibiotic resistance is spreading that means we need a better antimicrobial control and these antimicrobial controls need to be more specific so this new antimicrobial strategy that we want to invent should invent should be ideally more specific should not invoke any cross resistance that means if you are using a particular solution that solution should not inhibit you from using some another solution to combat antimicrobial resistance at the same time this new antimicrobial strategy other than antibiotics should be more should have novel mechanism of action because we want to use it against antibiotic resistant bacteria so you want novel strategies that have these different properties and hopefully other than antibiotics themselves now i told you that m xanthus can in principle lead to uh, maintenance of higher frequency of antibiotic resistance but in our lab we are also trying to identify novel strategies of combating this resistance using m xanthus itself 
and for that you we use evolution experiment it's a very powerful tool where what you can do is you can inoculate or you can culture your your predator and prey for a long long time and see the change in your predator that is see the change only in predator so what are the new adaptations that it is making over time over multiple generations which is allowing it to become a better hunter so what are the new claws what are the new jaws that it can make uh, or what are the new structures that it uh, or, or enzymes or new spears or uh, or or toxins it can make which will allow us to better control microbial infestation and we are hoping that this strategy will yield or identification of these predation mechanisms over time will yield a strategy which is more specific uh, does not invoke cross resistance has novel mechanism of action and hopefully we can use it against antibiotic resistant microbes also so remember in the first part we just talked about micro predation in general then we said hey microbes are very important and then we talked about diversity of microbes uh, and now in the second part i gave you two example one example with data and the second with with kind of the hypothesis how we can use them first to understand spread and emergence of antibiotic resistance and the second example i didn't talk about any results from these experiments was to identify novel antimicrobial strategies so i hope this gives you a little bit of idea about what microbial predators are and why they matter because they in this particular case in this particular example might actually unravel a big progress that was made over past many decades in controlling microbial infestations so with this i'll stop and thank you once again for for joining us uh, thanks to all the organizers for for having me here and looking forward to answering uh, questions if you have any thank you samay this was very interesting aspect of looking at uh, how bacteria can also do predation and can become prey to some other bacteria yes we do have some amazing questions uh they have come during your talk i would ask them one by one now so the first question is asked by atharva yes the question is uh, how does vampirococcus prevent itself from getting digested by its own enzymes yes so this is some i think this is a very interesting question uh and i also have the same question uh because sadly this is not a species very uh, which is studied in details uh what we know is that the enzymes uh, are themselves initially loaded on the membrane so they are outside the membrane uh and when the cells fuse with each other these membrane molecules somehow are being transferred to the to the prey but it's not very clear how they can then later on protect the the predator itself uh so what we know is that originally the enzymes themselves are on the membrane they are transferred to the prey with mechanism that we have absolutely no idea and then how the predator themselves are protected once the prey is digested don't know okay so i will take the next question um so this question has come from uh, venkat this is little bit on the side of application of this concept that you today talked about yeah. so uh, uh, it says that can we use this prey predator relationship uh, of uh, bacteria to be used as bio uh, biological fertilizers instead of chemicals yeah. um for example uh, any particular bacteria like uh, uh, the one we talked about today if it can prey on some other bacteria which is harmful for the plants and then that is how if it is preying on that harmful bacteria can we utilize this relationship to uh, to be used as fertilizers that's the question uh well i'm i'm not so sure so the question is can you use because the predator will uh, feed on the prey and then uh oh, by by for, do you mean by fertilizer some sort of a insect control or something or uh you know pest control or because that won't be fertilizer but in general i can tell you what we can do uh, uh i'm sorry i didn't get the question clearly uh so in it's not very wise to kind of introduce a new biological system a new organism into uh, a foreign ecosystem uh that's not a wise way to to deal with things however what you can do is the the knowledge you gain from from these interactions that you can definitely 
uh, apply uh, for for let's say you know uh, helping plants grow better for example we know that uh, mixocosanthus particularly in nature lives with a bacterium called penibacillus and this penibacillus bacterium is now if we if we just look through data and do a lot of a, a little bit of data mining that it becomes very evident that it is part of the the root ecosystem uh, so maybe that this that, that this interaction that uh, that one can explore to identify if you know you can bias the kind of diversity that you want around your roots which are more conducive for growth of plants and so on but again uh, you know this is we, we are just arm waving right now we are not that far uh, with understanding of predator bacteria or predation in bacteria in general so bacterial predation itself was discovered about 75 years ago uh, so it's not that old of uh, a science which is developed a lot and the first bacterial predator that was this, that was demonstrated to be actually a bacterial predator was mixocosanthus so the maximum information that we have is mixocosanthus everything else including you know for vampirococcus we had a question that hey how does it protect the reason we don't know is it's still relatively a new science and not a lot has been has been done yet but yes we can use predator prey interactions for a lot of good uh, but not directly introducing bacteria there, there rather using their services and then using hopefully those uh, those metabolites or proteins uh, or enzymes uh, to for the for the for the aim that we want to have uh, i hope this answers this question in general because i honestly didn't get it uh, get it properly but uh, yeah as as venkat said he's a non biologist uh, so that's why i just also gave a, a very very general answer yeah, yeah. so the next question is um, the context is your experiment where you have inoculated your uh, soil community with uh, um m xanthus and so the question is uh, goes like did you try co culturing uh, other bacteria uh, other than m xanthus with your soil uh, community to see the results what you are seeing yes uh, so may i know the name of the person praful praful the question is asked by praful hi so hi praful uh that's a good question and if you remember one of the uh one of the slides that i showed we had these streptomyces on on the right uh, so the reason lab is actually are harvesting streptomyces from soil is to do exactly same experiment because amzanthus can make antibiotics uh and therefore we is it directly amzanthus which is doing it or i can add any other antibiotic producing microbe in the mix and get the same results however i must tell you that since because we didn't have enough time i didn't go into the details we know that amzanthus is not doing it directly uh, you have to understand that multiple microbes are present in a soil sample right so this is like a interaction of network between multiple different species uh, so it's not amzanthus that is directly doing it uh, we think there's a there's a missing link in between uh, and that is uh, probably responsible so our hunch right now based on some of the preliminary data that we have is the phages that are ruling this this entire mechanism uh, so hopefully at some point if we have that answer i can come back to outside in and give the give the mechanism but this experiment we are trying yes so uh, next question is by subrita uh, does amzanthus form biofilms during the fruiting body stage yeah subrata yes uh, very true as in a fruiting body itself is a biofilm right many microbes stuck together that's biofilm uh, it, as in people have different definitions of biofilm uh, it can become very strict to to fairly relaxed definition uh, and for me any 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 system where multiple microbes are stuck together is a biofilm so fruiting body itself is a biofilm plus mixobacteria uh, while growing i showed you these colonies right uh, these are actually biofilms so these are swarming bacteria and these biofilms basically are expanding uh, so they form biofilms during fruiting body formation and otherwise also uh, in fact even if you put them in liquid culture they end up aggregating if you are not shaking them very fast so it's is biofilm former all throughout in its entire life cycle next question is asked by balwant kaur uh, is amzanthus also a prey to some microbial predator 
we haven't tested that yet uh and i must say it's not just us many other labs haven't tested that yet but what we know is uh, if you have different strains of enzantes so in nature as i said you know about 50% of the soil samples if you collect they'll have mix of enzantes uh, so we know that these two isolates that come from different soil samples they don't like each other and generally fight and kill each other uh and of course if you are killing other bacteria and the, the nutrients are just lying outside you use them as resources uh so enzantes can kill enzantes other microbes i am not very well aware of any systematic study uh, i must add to it that we there are some people who are studying enzantes and its interaction with eukaryotes such as nematodes it turns out enzantes can kill nematodes also uh so you never know what can kill enzantes uh yes so we don't know other other predators of enzantes but it it's not impossible that enzantes you know as in at the end of the day it's a bacterial cell uh, depending on the ecosystem let's say it's, it's present in the aquatic ecosystem it has it, it just has no life cycle so you can if you make that synthetic experiment of putting enzantes with let's say delovibrio then yes uh, it will be a prey to delovibrio because it just acts like a, a torpedo which will shoot into that that prey Hope this answers. Yeah. So next question is again by Subrata. Um, so this question uh, is in general asking that if we are culturing two bacteria on a plate, uh, how can one identify if these two bacteria they have prey predator relationship? For example, uh, the question is asked that if they grow separately. on same plate the colonies are not mixing into each other and they are kind of respecting their boundaries what does that mean do they have prey predator relationship or they do not have prey predator relationship well for prey as i said prey predator relationship means you have to actively kill right so, so simple competition experiment or you know just competing for nutrients is not predation that's not how we define it uh if you are just growing separately but not killing actively killing the other microbe and using the nutrients from them then again it's not it's not predation uh does not mean that interaction is not important in a ecological and evolutionary sense but strictly speaking predation is where you actively kill other cell and use them as nutrients um there is one more question again a uh, slightly uh discussing about the application aspect of this prey predation relationship of bacteria mm -hmm. um it it says uh, that are you planning to produce enzyme from the pure cultures and are you going to are you going to try them to prevent the predators and such that the soil can be healthy uh not right now so we are we are primarily interested in studying how uh, as in hopefully we can develop the basic understanding of the system to an extent that we can contribute back uh, in such a you know very meaningful way but right now uh, for us it's very important to understand what are the different mechanisms that uh, predator evolves uh, both in presence of antibiotic resistant microbes uh, in nature and in lab uh, and about enzymes yes so enzymes as i said can produce a lot of enzymes they are packed in vesicles so it's not difficult to 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 purify them uh many other labs have done that uh but primarily that's not uh, our interest but it's possible uh the question asked by viraj i was also actually wondering about this during your talk um the question is does the hunting mode of emzanthus depends on the prey species or any other specific factor so my my curiosity was does emzanthus has a uh, um selection that on what it will prey or it can prey anything that that comes across yes adding on to this question that was my question but first we can answer uh, viraj's question so uh, no that's it's a really good question uh, we ourselves are trying to understand this uh, and i can already tell you the approach that we are taking uh, right so one as a sim so one of the experiments that you can simply do is just look at emzanthus and see uh against if you if you expose it to different prey then what are the different types of predatory uh, proteome or transcriptome is upregulated uh the other way uh, which i think uh, and this is an easy way uh, to do and probably identify a little bit of it but what we are also trying to do in the lab is to evolve mixococcus xanthus against different prey species and see if they evolve specialization 
so uh, is is there adaptation to specific prey species that you uh, as in just try the evolution and and see if there's a trade off versus when you become specialized on one prey, prey species versus the other that will tell you a little bit more about uh, you know if the mechanisms of predation are different we are also trying to understand if it can sense different prey right as it there are three three aspects to predation can you find your prey so we are trying to understand can they detect different types of prey not just finding them killing we are trying to understand will they use different mechanisms to kill different prey species and uh, what we call as i mentioned as feeding but we call it handling is how well you can digest those prey species once you kill them and how much biomass you can produce ourselves uh, we don't uh, we don't know that yet but what we know is that different prey species or different soil bacteria are distinct are have different sensitivities to amzanthus predations for example generally gram positive bacteria are more resistant and gram negative bacteria are more sensitive to predation that's what we we know for now right uh next question is um, that uh, for the amzanthus during mm -hmm. its predating on other bacteria can you tell us about what are the enzymes involved in this process many uh the more common ones are peptidases and proteases because amzanthus likes uh, peptides and amino acids as its carbon source so if you grow it in in glucose media as the only carbon source uh, glucose being the only carbon source it does not grow Uh, so the enzymes are primarily protein degrading enzymes uh next question is again by venkat he is clarifying that he earlier in earlier question he meant about the pest control but mm -hmm. now he is asking one more question where he is saying the does the prey predator relationship change uh, if there is change in the environment let's say the temperature is changing do the prey predator relationship change do their activities change do we know anything about this yes venkat so this is uh, as in this is simple biology of a microbial cell uh, or even the physics of microbial cell actually makes it very obvious that uh, that the relationships should change for example let's say a bacterium which is approaching its prey a different amount of humidity uh, it might you know move at a faster or slower rate uh, a uh, different amount of nutrient source uh, availability of those nutrient source uh, all these things would definitely matter uh, as in, in this so for this particular question i think it would be better for you to imagine a microbial cell as just a small chemical factory uh, any environmental change will affect uh, microbial behavior uh, including even if all these abiotic factors are same and the only thing that you change is the density or the frequency of predator and prey then everything changes uh, that's also you know so yes the answer to your question is yes all right so there was one question um asked by sodamini uh, uh she was asking that uh, what do you think uh, of bacteria eating a plastic or oil spills um or magnetobacteria and do you do you have any um com comments to Uh, make about these kind of bacteria and what do you know about them and if we can uh, you can tell us about these kind of bacteria so i have to confess i'm i'm not an expert on 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 magnetobacteria specifically because though i think that they are they're really fascinating however to control oil spills uh, and so on i think there are a lot of efforts that people are making to identify you know uh, novel strategies of doing it uh, is i think there are a bunch of experiments where people have been evolving microbes to degrade uh, plastic to degrade oil and maybe isolate the, the active components that are responsible for it and so on uh, but frankly i don't have a detailed understanding of it i just know that there's ton of literature but i also know there's no no solution yet uh, and we are far far away from solution uh, so it looks like though you know you can always make it sound hunky dory you can play evolution or you know tape of life in the in the lab it's not as straight forward uh, yeah i don't have a, a clear comment on that um thanks ama it looks like we uh, we do not have further questions uh, i think we, you have answered uh, probably everyone's doubt and it was amazing talk um i would like to uh, oh yeah wait sorry there's just one question popped up okay. um 
So the question says, uh, in the co-culture experiment, you grow the bacteria in the culture with known antibiotics. What if the bacteria have antibiotic resistance and so they are getting out of... So I, I think the question means that you are you are co in your co-culturing experiments, you are using known antibiotics, but what if there are some other uh, antibiotic uh, resistance that they might have, which you are not checking for? So how do you... Uh, well, so uh, the simple answer is then, so one way to study microbes is culturing them and looking them under microscope. The other way to do is, is to sequence them. So we are sequencing these populations. Uh, we are doing metagenome sequences, not only 16S. Uh, so this will tell us all the different types of alleles uh, that are responsible for antibiotic resistance uh, in general, uh, and also diversity of this community. So we know that for example, uh, we know that M. xanthus in these communities only survives for 24 hours. But within those 24 hours, it actually invades these communities. And the resistance frequency only pops up after M. xanthus is dead. Uh, so after 24 hours, we don't detect M. xanthus in these populations. So we are interested in, in understanding, yes, which are the other resistant phenotype or other resistant genotypes that are present and the diversity during the course of our experiments, because these are culturing experiments, right? So they go about for four days and so on. Uh, so we know that we are missing them out and we are figuring out, yes. Yeah, so um, I think I will uh, ask uh, Saudamini for any concluding remarks. And I think here we end the question and answer session. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, so it was a very fascinating talk, uh, bringing in the philosophy of predation and how it applies to bacteria, uh, especially in the context of antibiotic resistance. Yeah, very important topic uh, in general. And uh, I would like to thank the communications team, especially Pavitra and the NCBS for uh, supporting this uh, webinar series outside in. And um, yeah, I would also especially like to thank uh, Samai Pandey for uh, presenting this very uh, interesting talk in a way that is simple to understand. And uh, for those of you who might have missed the beginning, uh, the introduction, uh, Samai is uh, in the microbiology department of Indian Institute of Science. Uh, thanks to Deepa uh, Agashe, my co-host, uh, who has uh, chosen uh, the topic and the speaker for today. And also thanks to Sneha for moderating the question and answer sessions. And um, I wish to um, remind you, the fine audience who's here, uh, that next week we meet around the same time, but at 10 a.m., yeah, 10 a.m. instead of 11 a.m., wherein uh, we will have Sujal Padke, and uh, he and she's going to talk about microbial uh, mating mechanisms. And she's from the Radi Children's Institute for Genomic Medicine, uh, from San Diego. With this, uh, I wish to all thank you all for uh, being with us today and uh, we'll meet next week. Until then, please take care. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining in.